Keep away from me. I have a weapon, and I'm not afraid to use it. Oh, I don't think that will do you much good now. Stay back, you... you... you disgusting train! Now, that's not a very nice way to talk to your host. I have a name, after all. You can call me... Charles. Ch Charles? Didn't they tell you my name before they sent you out here to kill me? No. Well, that's disappointing. You see, I wasn't always like this, so strong and powerful. In fact, I was once like you, a human being, a small, scared human being, exactly the way you are now. Would you like to hear the story of how I became this way? A story? That's right. Maybe by the end, you'll understand why I became like this. And if you do, maybe I'll even let you live. What do you say? Okay. It all began on this very island, just one year ago. Young Master Charles, you know your father doesn't like you playing in there. My name was Warren Charles the Fourth. First and only son of my father, and owner of this island, Warren Charles III. But everyone on the island called me Master Charles. My father was a rich man, and had purchased a mine on this island. But it hadn't been as successful as he once hoped. And so we moved here so that he could oversee it personally. There weren't any other children on the island so I had no one to play with, except for my teacher and babysitter, Eugene. Eugene was no fun, so I spent most of my time trying to get away from him and play on my own. Today I was playing in the mines. I loved it there. It was like a maze, full of creepy tunnels that turned this way and that. I could hide from Eugene for hours there, I heard his voice echoing behind me in the tunnels, so I decided to hide and give him a scare. I ducked behind some barrels, but I must have bumped something, because soon the tunnels started to rumble and shake. Pebbles and dust started to fall from the ceiling, and then, with a crash, the whole roof of the tunnel came down. Everything went dark. I thought I was dead. Eugene emerged from the tunnel, carrying my broken body. My father and his personal doctor arrived not long after. My father was crying, convinced that his son was dead. But the doctor wasn't so sure. I have something. A new experimental procedure that may be able to save the boy. Do it. Anything for my son. I'll spare no expense. The doctor took me back to his cabin, which acted as the island's medical clinic, too. There, the doctor revealed a special machine he had been experimenting with. This machine is going to revolutionize medicine. Will it save my son? What does it do? You see, we'll place your son here, and this automaton over here. You mean a dummy? Well, yes, but it won't be dumb for very long. What do you mean? Your son's body is destroyed. He'll die if he stays in it. But I can transfer his consciousness to this. It will save his life. My father was unsure. But he was so worried that he gave the doctor his approval. But wait. Is it safe? I think so. I've been testing it extensively. On rats. The doctor threw the switch and the process of swapping my consciousness into its new body began. I was woken up by the worst pain I had ever experienced, as I felt my mind pulled from my body, transferred across the wires, and forced into this android. For a moment, I couldn't feel anything. But then, as I settled into my new form, I felt my face start to stretch. I was overcome with emotion 
and that must have been reflected on the face of my new body, because its face started to twist and change too. It turned into a terrible, wide grin. When I sat up from the table and saw my old body lying next to me, I wanted to cry, but my hard, unmoving, always smiling face wouldn't shed a tear. I tried my best to adjust to what I had become. I was used to being on my own on the island. There were no other children after all, but I wasn't prepared for the reaction I would get from the grown workers. The nice ones would simply try their best not to look directly at me. Others would try to avoid my presence, but the worst were the ones who would stare. They would look at me with a mix of pity and disgust. But there was something more, too. Deep down, I knew they weren't just revolted by me. They were afraid of me. I was playing on my own one day. When I heard the sound of one of the island's workers behind me, I turned to find the usual sight of him staring at me. He tried to apologize, saying that he hadn't meant to disturb me. But even as he backed away from me, he wouldn't take his eyes off of me, wouldn't stop looking at my face. As I walked towards him, he kept backing up, dropping his mining pick on the ground. Please, Master Charles, I didn't mean anything by it. I'm sorry. But his words rang hollow to me. He had come out here to look at the disgusting monster, to mock me. So I did the only logical thing and picked up the mining pick he had dropped and struck him with it. You see, my artificial body was quite strong, stronger than it had ever been as a boy. And the blow from the pick was strong enough to break the arm that he had tried to defend himself with. The other workers were told that he had been in an accident, but word soon spread, and they knew the truth. I'm not sure if they meant it as a joke, or if some really believed that it would keep them safe, but some of the workers soon started wearing masks, masks that looked exactly like me. I suppose they figured if they looked as terrible as I did, that I wouldn't want to harm them. Or maybe they just wanted to make fun of me. Either way, I didn't care. It did make me happy seeing them look exactly like me. So happy, in fact, that I wanted everyone on the island to do the same. There were still some holdouts, though. They'd need to become even more afraid of my wrath if I was going to convince them. I was watching from a hill nearby when my father unveiled his newest piece of machinery for the island mine. It was a train, but a special one. Instead of wheels, it had long metallic legs like a spider that allowed it to go anywhere, over any type of terrain. Everyone watching was very impressed by the new invention, but all I could see was the train's inventor. He was a young engineer, one of the youngest men on the whole island. Handsome, strong, and smart. Everyone seemed to love this man, to want to be around him. I hated him, and yet I also wanted to be around him. No, that's not right. I wanted to be him. If I could somehow look like him, then no one would be afraid of me anymore. I'd have lots of friends. I'd be happy once again. I started to think, how could I not just look like this man, but become him? The doctor who had saved my life was more than happy to tell me all about his machine. He told me about the experiments he had done with animals prior to using it on me. But what about the opposite? Could my mind be placed back into a human body? The doctor told me that it hadn't been tried before. It might be too dangerous. 
there was a good chance that a body couldn't survive the stress of the reverse process. That sounded like a risk I was willing to take. I waited until one night when the engineer was working late on the new train. He was working in the mine tunnels, and he was all alone. With my automaton body, I was able to overpower him quite easily and tie him up. After that, I ran to get the doctor. There's been a terrible accident at the mine. The doctor grabbed all of his medical equipment, including the experimental machine, and followed me back to the mine. When we got there, he saw the engineer tied up on the ground. What's going on here? I knocked the doctor out and tied him up as well. Now I had everything I needed. I woke the doctor up and forced him to tell me how to set the machine up. I attached it to the engineer and myself. The doctor kept pleading with me, telling me that it would kill the young man, but I just ignored him. Finally, everything was ready. What's going on? Why isn't it working? You need a power source. I looked around and spotted one, the engine of the special new train. I connected the machine to the power source. Now, everything was really ready. This time, when I flipped the switch, the machine came alive. It was just like before when my mind was transferred out of my human body. But this time, I'd be going back. I'd be human once again. I could feel my mind start to be stretched and pulled. I screamed in pain and watched as the engineer grimaced in agony as well. It was beautiful. But then, something went wrong. I heard a noise behind me and saw that the doctor had managed to roll on the ground towards the machine. No! With his foot, he managed to hit a button on the machine that reversed the power flow. My mind snapped back into my metal body, and then the machine overloaded. There was an explosion of sparks as my mind was then forced through the wires, not into the engineer's body, but into the train powering the machine. I could feel myself changing once again as my mind was imprinted onto the steel mechanisms within the train. I screamed as I was changed, and the train changed too. With the screeching of metal twisting and stretching, the front of the train transformed, becoming an even worse mockery of my already ugly face. My plan had failed, or had it? I stood up on my new, mechanical spider-like legs. I felt the strength and power that existed in my locomotive body. I realized that I wasn't sad at all about what happened. I now had exactly what I wanted. Power. The power to make people truly fear me. I emerged from the tunnel, a new entity, one that the world had never seen before. And I'd make sure that those who did see me would never be seen again. Except those few workers who would still wear masks that looked like my face. The island was mine now, and I'd kill anyone who dared come here. Which is why they sent you here. You can try and kill me, but even if you had succeeded, it wouldn't have mattered. You see, I figured out I could lay eggs, don't ask me how, and implant my consciousness into them. It must have been some side effect of the machine. So even if you had managed to kill me, I'll just keep coming back. There's nothing you can do to stop me now. There's nothing anyone can do. This train will just keep rolling on forever and ever and ever. Choo, choo. A group of archivists are running for their lives through the maze of twisting passages in the mine. Behind them is the most frightening creature any of these professional monster hunters have ever seen. Nothing could prepare them for this. A huge spider train hybrid, a horrifying monster with gigantic spider legs growing out of its train body, and a face like a nightmare version of Thomas the Tank Engine. This 
is the monster they were sent here to destroy. This is Choo Choo Charles. He chases them deeper and deeper into the tunnels, but then suddenly he stops as they near a room at the end of a tunnel with a door. It's as if he doesn't want them to go in there. The archivists are confused what could possibly be inside that would stop Charles, but they don't have any time to think about it. This is their only option, so all of them run into the room and shut the door behind them. They see something amazing inside. Eggs. Strange, glowing eggs, much larger than any regular chicken egg or even the kind an ostrich lays. No, these are something much stranger, and one of the archivists knows what they are. These must be Choo Choo Charles' eggs, so that's why he didn't want us to come in here. Outside the room, they can hear Charles growing angry. He's smashing into the door, doing everything he can to break it down. The room shakes and rumbles. One of the archivists picks up one of the three eggs, but when Charles rams the door again, they lose their balance and drop the egg. The egg hits the ground and a crack forms across its surface. That doesn't look good. The monster hunters watch as the crack gets bigger and bigger. The egg then begins to shake, and they realize that Charles has stopped attacking the door, so that can't be what's causing the egg to move. The egg suddenly splits open, and a small, thin, metallic spider leg reaches out. What the? The rest of the creature soon follows. It's a baby version of Choo Choo Charles. The baby Charles tries to stand up, but it has trouble, like a baby deer still getting used to its new legs. One of the archivists picks the baby Charles up off the ground. It's kind of cute, isn't it? Cute. We have to destroy it. The archivist pulls the baby away from the other monster hunter, shielding it. No, we can study this, learn from it. Maybe it'll even help us figure out how to beat the real Choo Choo Charles. But before they can argue any more, something interrupts them. They turn to watch the other two eggs, which both now also have cracks forming on their surface. Soon they too crack open, and two more of the baby trained spider hybrids crawl out. See? There are too many of them. It's too dangerous. We have to destroy them now. The monster hunter tries to wrestle the baby away from the archivist. They start fighting over the baby Charles, tugging it back and forth. They look like they are on the verge of coming to blows when the other archivist speaks up. Um, guys, they're getting away. They all turn to see the two new babies crawling up towards a hole in the wall. Quick, stop them! They try to grab the babies, but they're too high up the wall already, and soon they both disappear into the hole. The one being held then leaps out of the arms of the archivist holding it and scampers up the wall and follows its sibling out of the hole as well. We have to find them! They open the door and poke their heads outside. No sign of the real Choo Choo Charles. He must have left. They see that the hole in the wall led right outside of the room to the same tunnel and there are distinctive tiny spider leg tracks on the ground. At least they'll be able to follow these to see where they went. They follow the tracks out of the cave where the one set of tracks splits off into three. It looks like all the baby spider trains went in different directions. The group agrees that they don't have a choice. All of them will have to go out to find the missing babies. If I find one, I'm taking it to the lab. It's the safest place and I can study it there, see if there's anything we can learn. Fine, but if anything strange happens, you have to agree you'll destroy it. The archivists then split up, each going to deal with their own Choo Choo Charles baby problem. They each need to be careful though. The real, full-grown Charles is out there somewhere along with who knows what else. The first archivist follows the small spider tracks out of the mine tunnels. The tracks go this way and that, circling around and doubling back on themselves. Just where are you headed, little guy? They keep following the tracks and notice that they appear to be heading in the direction of some rocky hills. It starts to get harder to follow the tracks as the dirt starts to transition to stone, but each time they think they've lost the trail, they spot some tracks up ahead. The tracks continue on into the rocky hills, and the archivist looks up to see that they are taking them right into an opening, not a mine tunnel, but a naturally occurring cave in the hillside. They poke their head in and call out, Hello? Anyone in here? But there's no response. The second archivist follows their own set of tracks. The tracks follow those of the other at first, but then veer off and head straight towards a thick group of trees. Soon, the archivist is walking in the dense forest, it's so dark under the trees that it's hard to see the tracks, and their dim flashlight isn't doing much good. The archivist hears a noise and spins around, searching the trees with their flashlight. Who's there? They can't see anyone, but could it be the baby Charles? Or is it the full-sized one? 
the third archivist's track split off from the others straight away and appeared to head towards the beach. The archivist is able to follow the tracks in the sand easily, but they stop as they get close to the water. Something feels wrong. The water is a dark black color under the moonless night sky. But then, they notice something else. It's oddly still. There's no waves at all. The archivist walks deeper into the cave, still following the tracks. But then, they suddenly stop. Hey, where'd you go? The tracks seem to just disappear. But then, they look up. Aha! The tracks continue on the ceiling. They keep following them, looking up at the ceiling when they get tripped up. Their foot is caught on something. It's another footprint in the dirt. And it's deep. Whatever made this is very, very big. But it doesn't look like it came from Choo Choo Charles. Besides, he wouldn't fit in here, right? The archivist in the forest spins around, trying to capture whatever is moving around in the trees in the beam of their flashlight. But they can never quite find it. Something is out there, though. They know it. They just hope it's the little spider they're looking for. The archivist on the beach looks out at the still water, wondering what's happening. There's no sign of anything, though. Just the very quiet sound of a buoy bobbing out in the distance. There you are! The archivist gets up and brushes the dirt off of their pants. The baby Choo Choo Charles is right in front of them, clinging to the wall of the cave. They reach out to pick it up, and the baby spider train recoils like it is scared. Don't worry, I'm not gonna hurt you. They grab the baby Charles not noticing the huge, monstrous bug creature looming behind them. The archivist continues spinning around in the woods, pointing their flashlight this way and that. I'm gonna find you. You might as well show yourself now. Their request is immediately answered. The baby Charles they were following bursts out of the woods and right into their arms. Gotcha. But there's no time to celebrate, since the baby Charles wasn't running to them. It was running from something else. The archivist screams as the shadowy figure suddenly emerges from the trees, heading straight towards them. Finally, I found you! The baby Charles on the beach is hiding under an overturned boat, but there appears to be something wrong with it. It's lying on its side and seems to be in pain. What's wrong? Are you hurt? The archivist moves to check on it, not noticing the huge tentacle slowly emerging from the calm sea behind them. Ah! The archivist screams as they turn to see the massive insect monster staring back at them, its compound eyes shining in the dark. In their fear, they punch the giant bug in the face before running past them, gripping the baby Charles to their chest. The bug monster doesn't take kindly to being hit, though, and is soon right behind them, nipping at the archivist's heels as they run through the cave. The archivist in the woods is on the run, too, but they can't see exactly what it is that's pursuing them. All they know is, it's a shadowy figure. And even when they turn while running to try and shine their flashlight at them, it's as if the creature absorbs the beam of light and reflects nothing back. They have no choice but to keep running. The archivist on the beach screams as the tentacle wraps around their leg and lifts them up into the air. The baby Charles hiding under the boat still seems sick, like something is wrong with it. It starts to shake and make strange noises as the archivist is swung back and forth in the air by the strange tentacle emerging from the sea. Something starts to happen to the baby Charles begins to change. One after another, each of its legs gets a little longer. Its body stretches and increases in size. Even its teeth get a little bigger and sharper. It's not a full-sized Choo Choo Charles yet, but it's growing up. The juvenile Charles stands up. Another tentacle pops out of the sea and heads towards it. The now slightly bigger trained spider fights back, though. It slashes and bites at the tentacle. The sea monster wasn't expecting a fight, and a squeal of pain comes from somewhere beneath the ocean's surface. It drops the archivist on the sand as the juvenile Charles collapses in exhaustion. It used most of its energy for growing, and now needs to rest. The archivist stands up, woozy from being tossed around by the monster, and scoops the Choo Choo Charles child up out of the sand. They take the newly evolved Charles to the island's medical lab, where they hope they can learn something about it. The archivist is still running through the cave, there are more passageways than they remember on the way in, and they're scared both by the bug monster chasing them and by the fact that they might be lost. They realize their fear is real when they find themselves in a dead end. They turn to see the giant insect blocking the only way out. It rushes forward with snapping jaws, and the archivist leaps out of the way at the very last moment. The insect crashes into the wall of the cave, and there's a rumble as bits of stone begin to fall down from the ceiling. The archivist takes the opportunity and goes on the run again. This time they turn down the right path and see a glimmer of light, the exit. They run as fast as they can, 
but the giant insect is right behind them once again. It reaches out with its sticky mandibles, but just before its jaws can snap shut on the archivist, a huge boulder falls from the ceiling and lands on its head. It's dead, or at least knocked out, and the archivist runs out of the cave with the baby Charles. The other archivist is still on the run too, and they aren't out of the woods yet. They run through the thick trees, ducking under branches and leaping over fallen trunks. The archivist runs out of the woods with the baby Charles he just rescued. He turns to see the shadowy figure still charging, but then it stops just as it reaches the edge of the trees. It pauses and then begins to retreat back into the darkness of the forest. The archivist spots the medical lab off in the distance and sees that the lights are on. Someone else must have made it there. Both of the archivists arrive at the medical lab at the same time, relieved to see that the other is alive as well. They both go into the medical lab, where they are in for a shock. Not only has the baby Charles grown, but now it's even bigger than it was on the beach. It's so big, in fact, that the archivist had to put it in a cage. The other two baby Charleses seem upset over seeing their sibling in the cage, and they start to thrash around, leaving the archivists with no choice but to lock them up in cages as well. When the commotion is finally over, the one who has been doing the research has some terrible news. I've been studying this one, and not only is it growing, but it appears to be sending out some kind of signal. What do you mean a signal? It's generating some kind of radio wave. I think it's calling out. Calling out to who? I don't know for sure, but I can guess. There's a loud noise outside, and they peek out the window to see what has caused it. It's the real, full-grown Choo Choo Charles. It's back. They watch as it destroys one of the nearby cabins. It's clearly looking for them, and knows they're in this area. I told you we should have destroyed them when we had the chance. Wait, we don't have to. Watch. The archivist shows what they've been experimenting with. They've come up with a way to freeze the spider trains using liquid nitrogen gas. It causes their inner workings to lock up and stop working until they are heated up to a high temperature. The archivist uses the gas to freeze the two that are still babies first, sending them into a deep sleep-like state. The archivist is about to freeze the grown one when Choo Choo Charles bursts through the wall of the medical lab. He grabs one of the archivists with his long, powerful spider arm and drags him out into the night. The other archivists work quickly to finish freezing the last one, and they spray him with the cooling gas just in time, because the full-grown Choo Choo Charles is back again. They try to spray the full-grown Charles with the gas too, hoping it will have the same effect, but all it seems to do is annoy the giant train spider. They each grab one of the small cages and run out into the night. Choo Choo Charles chases after them. It's not clear if he wants to save the babies or kill the archivists, but either way, they have no choice but to flee. Choo Choo Charles is enraged, slashing and pounding its massive legs. The archivists do what they can to evade its attacks as they head towards a wooden bridge. Just before they can reach the bridge, one of the archivists is grabbed by the train spider. With its incredible strength, it tosses him like a child throwing a doll, flinging the body into the dark, where it lands with a hard thud hundreds of feet away. The last remaining archivist picks up the dropped cage and keeps running. They make it across the wooden bridge, but Choo Choo Charles is still in pursuit. Just before Charles reaches the other end, the archivist presses the button that activates the hidden explosives attached to the bridge. The bridge explodes with such force that the archivist is knocked backwards off their feet. They watch as Choo Choo Charles screams and falls into the deep ravine, finally landing far below, no longer moving. The archivist stands up and picks up the two cages with the comatose Choo Choo Charles baby still inside. The bridge was the only way back to the medical lab, so they'll have to hope that the remaining Charles offspring will remain in its frozen state until they can return with help. The young man ran through the forest in fear. Behind in the darkness, he could hear the huge, powerful thing that was chasing him getting closer and closer. Its gigantic metallic spider legs tearing into the hard ground and knocking deeply rooted trees aside with ease. The man ran harder and faster than he ever had in his life. He knew if this thing caught him, it would be all over. He turned his neck to look behind him to see how close the monster was to getting him, and when he turned back around, smack! The world went black. He had run headfirst into a low branch, knocking him out instantly. The man slowly opened his eyes. Where? Where was he? He was lying on the forest floor, but where was the monster? He turned his head and looked left, and then right. Nothing. Still lying on the ground, he craned his neck and looked up to see… Ah! It was the monster. 
Choo Choo Charles, and he was looming right over. The young man covered his eyes and screamed. This was it. This was the end of his life. He screamed and screamed and screamed. But nothing happened. He slowly opened his eyes and peeked through his fingers. The monster wasn't attacking. He was just staring at him. You can stop screaming now. The man finally stopped screaming. Was Charles going to eat him or just look at him? I'm not going to eat you. There was his answer. The man slowly stood up to look at the gigantic half-train, half-spider hybrid monster that was standing before him. I'm not going to hurt you at all. In fact, I need your help. Now the man was really confused. What help could he possibly provide the Choo Choo Charles? Was this some kind of a trick or a prank before he killed him? The man began to calm down. After all, if Choo Choo Charles had wanted him dead, he easily could have done it by now. The man asked what Choo Choo Charles wanted from him. All I want you to do is listen to my story. Listen to his story? A strange request, but it didn't seem the young man had much of a choice. Choo Choo Charles told the young man his origin story, a tale about how he was once a young man himself, not that different from the man standing before him. In fact, that's why he was asking this young man for his help. He reminded Choo Choo Charles of what he might have grown up to be himself, had he not been transformed in that terrible accident. He told the story of how first his soul was ripped from his body and placed inside a new, fake body, how he had become something like a living doll. But then, through another terrible series of events, how he became the horrible creature the man now saw, a half-train, half-spider, with a heart full of rage. As the man listened, he actually felt bad for Choo Choo Charles. He had no idea about the pain he had suffered. The way he described how his mind was torn out of his body and transferred by a machine into a new one sounded awful. Charles told him the way it was indescribable, like the worst pain you've ever encountered multiplied by a million, spreading across your whole body, until then suddenly your consciousness was cut off, compressed, and squeezed into a wire, before being compressed and slammed into a new body. It was as if he had died a hundred times, only to wake up in a new, horrendous form, an eternal prison for his mind. That was how he had become the monster that now lurked this island, but he was about to discover another terrible change that had happened to him. As he slept in his cave deep below the island's surface, he awoke one morning to find that there was something strange sitting beneath him. An egg. Not only was he a monster, but he was reproducing, making new little versions of himself. Whether he loved them or not, these were his children, and he had to protect them from the humans who kept attacking and trying to destroy them. The young man felt something strange inside of him. Was it sympathy? He was actually starting to feel bad for this monster if it was true that all he wanted to do was protect his babies. But the humans weren't the only ones. I soon discovered that there was something even down in the same caves that I was hiding in. Something that even I feared. The young man was shocked. How could there be something that even Choo Choo Charles was afraid of? The young man asked, but before he could get an answer, there was a sound in the trees. Both the man and Choo Choo Charles looked to see a group of hunters burst out of the forest. They were armed with weapons and shouted for the young man to get to safety, that they would save him from the monster. The young man tried to tell them that Choo Choo Charles wasn't a threat to them, but they didn't listen and rushed in to attack him. Choo Choo Charles was left with no choice but to defend himself and showed the true extent of his power. The young man tried to hide to escape the fighting as Charles easily tossed the humans aside with his powerful, mechanical spider legs. Others he charged at, barreling down on them like the train he was, crushing them against trees and rocks. It was over as quickly as it had begun. The small group of humans were all either dead or had run away, and only the young man and the train spider monster remained. Come with me. I have more to tell you. Before the young man could respond, Choo Choo Charles had picked him up with one of his legs, placed him on top of his roof, told him to hold on tight, and took off into the night. They soon arrived at the entrance to a cave, the entrance to a system of tunnels and chambers that went deep below the island. This was where Choo Choo Charles hid from the humans. Charles took the young man through the winding cavern, eventually bringing him to a large open room that was full of strange glowing eggs. These must be the eggs containing his babies. The young man thought that there might be a few of them, but there were dozens, maybe even hundreds spread across the cave. These were what Choo Choo Charles was trying to protect from the humans? Not just the humans, 
There's something even worse. Something worse? If it was something even Choo Choo Charles was afraid of, then it must be truly frightening. From the safety of his subterranean lair, Choo Choo Charles continued with his story. He told the young man about the history he had learned about the island from his tutor, that the island of Araniram had people living on it long before the miners ever arrived. But these ancient people weren't the only inhabitants. There were horrible creatures that roamed the island, monsters that would attack and try to eat anyone they could. The humans fought back against these monsters, but they were vicious, vile beasts, and no matter how many of them they would kill, the monsters would just keep returning. No one knew how many of them there were, or how they just kept coming and coming and coming, but eventually, the inhabitants of the island were able to defeat them, not by killing them, but by sealing them away within the cave system under the island. That should have been the end of it, but now, with the miners tunneling right into that same system of caves, the monsters had returned. But why should Choo Choo Charles care? After all, didn't he and the monsters want the same thing, to kill the humans living on this island? Well, yes, if that's all they were doing, then he wouldn't care. But there was something else that seemed to attract the monsters, something that they desperately wanted, Charles's eggs. And he wasn't about to let anyone get those. And this is why Choo Choo Charles needed this young man's help. He could tell that there was something special about him, something that would let him see Choo Choo Charles' side of the story, that all he really wanted to do was protect his eggs, protect his children, protect his family. He needed the young man to explain that to the other humans on the island and to get them to work together with him to destroy the monsters once and for all. The young man looked around the cave full of eggs, imagining each one containing a little baby version of the spider train. Even though to him they seemed to be the same as the horrible monsters Charles was describing, he couldn't help but feel some sympathy for the little baby choo-choos. The young man agreed to help how he could, to try and talk to the other humans and convince them to help. He was going to trust Choo Choo Charles, even though he hadn't actually seen any of these monsters, but he was about to get his chance. There was a loud shriek from one of the tunnels connected to the cave. Seconds later, out of the dark tunnel, emerged one of the creatures the young man had just heard about. It was awful to look at, like a gigantic insect with glowing eyes and gnashing teeth. The bug monster charged at the young man, and he cowered in fear, but it went straight past him. It wasn't the young man it wanted. It was the eggs. Choo Choo Charles sprang into action to protect his young, and the two engaged in a fierce battle, grappling and striking each other with their many arms. The insect latched onto Charles's back and scratched at him. Unable to reach him, Charles did the only thing he could and leapt into the air, flipping over and landing on his own back, crushing the monster under his weight. It was enough to stun the monster, but not finish him off. Charles saw that this was his chance to flee, though, and started to quickly gather up as many eggs as he could carry, before grabbing the young man as well and rushing out of the cave. The strange pair made their way through the tunnels, and the shriek that came behind them told them that it wouldn't be long before the bug monster would be right behind them. But they had bigger problems, when Charles rounded a corner and nearly ran right into a group of humans. They were archivists, the kind that were often sent to the island on behalf of the mining company to try and destroy Choo Choo Charles, just like the young man had been. The humans immediately began attacking the train monster they had been hunting. Charles tried his best to block their attacks without fighting back, but the humans were relentless. He'd have to defend himself. But then, they spotted the young man. One of the archivists yelled to the others to stop attacking so they wouldn't hurt him, and the humans stopped their assault. There was very little time to explain, but the young man quickly tried to fill them in on what he had learned, that Charles was just trying to defend his family, and that there was an even worse monster about to descend upon them. The group of archivists were split over what they had just been told. Some thought the young man was under Choo Choo Charles's control in some way. Perhaps he had the power to control minds. While others simply thought he was lying or had gone nuts down here in the cave. But then they heard the ear-splittingly loud squeal from deeper in the caves. That's it. They decided to trust this strange story and work together to defeat the monster. It was a good thing they made their decision so quickly, since only seconds later, the bug monster appeared again. It went straight for Charles, but then the archivists joined the fight. The bug monster fought even more fiercely than it had the first time, attacking and spraying toxic venom at Charles and the archivists. Some of the toxin landed on one of the eggs, and the young man tried to wipe it away, but it burned his hands. He watched as the egg began to shake, and a small crack formed on it. A tiny version of Choo Choo Charles then emerged, even though it was just a few seconds old, it seemed to know just what to do and immediately ran in to join the fight against the monster as well. 
the bug fought like a demon, killing several of the archivists and causing serious damage to Choo Choo Charles. It looked like it might be on the verge of victory, when suddenly, more of the eggs began to hatch. Even more baby Choo Choo Charles crawled out of their shells, and soon all of the baby spider trains had entered the fray. With so many of the small spiders now crawling all over it, the giant insectoid finally started to slow, and seeing a chance to land the killing blow, Choo Choo Charles rushed forward and finished it off. The bug monster fell to the ground. It was now dead, but so too were many of the archivists. Despite what the young man had told them, they were convinced that none of this would have happened if not for Choo Choo Charles, that he had led the monster here somehow or was working with him. The young man tried to stop them, telling them that he only wanted to defend his babies, but they decided it was too dangerous to let any of the spider trains leave the cave alive. The archivists attacked, and now Charles really did have no choice but to fight back. He swung one of his massive spider legs towards an archivist, but in the carnage, didn't realize that the young man had placed himself between Choo Choo Charles and the human in an attempt to get them to stop fighting. Charles struck the young man, sending him hard into the cave wall. The young man hit the wall head first and limply collapsed onto the floor. Choo Choo Charles howled in anger. The only human who had ever given him a chance and tried to help him was now dead, and it was all these humans' fault. Charles attacked again with twice as much fervor. He was winning the battle and had taken out several of the archivists, but then he saw one of his children cornered by an archivist. He could win this fight, but he had to protect his babies. Charles broke away from the fighting and gathered up all of his newly hatched children. He placed them on his back and retreated, running off back to the dark maze of caverns. The human archivists checked on their fallen colleagues. All of them were dead, except for one, the young man. He was still alive. They cursed the monster that had done this to him, but with final breaths, the young man told them, No, he's only trying to protect his family. Choo Choo Charles is not a monster. Do it now! Blow up the bridge! Archivists screamed as they tried their best to defend themselves from the giant half-train, half-spider that was on top of them. They rolled this way and that, trying to avoid the train's huge legs as it slammed them down, each strike sending bolts of red, demonic energy scattering through the air. The other archivist watched from just beyond the bridge, too injured to help their friend. Press the button! There's no time! The injured archivist took out the detonator for the explosives placed around the bridge. They knew that once they pressed the button, the bridge would blow up, sending Choo Choo Charles plummeting below to his death, along with their friend. They watched as the battle continued to rage on the bridge, the archivists trying their best to fight back against the powerful spider train. As they dodged attacks, they called out to their archivist friend once again, Please, press the button! For me! With a flash of red lightning, Choo Choo Charles teleported behind the archivist on the bridge and picked them up with one of his powerful arms. The archivist looked into the distorted, smiling face on the front of Charles's train, and the archivist began to laugh. Choo Choo Charles looked confused, but could possibly be funny. That's when Charles saw the archivist on the far side of the bridge and the detonator they were holding in their hand. The archivist pressed the giant red button on the detonator to trigger the explosives, and one by one, they began to go off. Choo Choo Charles casually tossed the archivist off the side of the bridge and began to move away from the explosions, using his teleportation ability to jump forward as quickly as he could. But Choo Choo Charles wasn't fast enough. The explosions caught up to him, and the bridge fell away beneath him. The demon spider train felt the solid ground disappear beneath him and fell down into the deep ravine, hitting the jagged rocks below with a loud crash. The surviving archivist stood at the edge of the ruined bridge, looking down at the dead monster. They were the only survivor. But they had done it. They had beaten Choo Choo Charles. It was all over. Or was it? As the archivist walked away from the site of the battle, now concerned with how they'd get off the island, they had no idea that deep below the ground, hidden in the caverns that formed a maze beneath the island's surface, something was stirring. It was an egg, a strange, glowing egg. It shook slightly as a crack began to form on its surface. But this cavern didn't contain just one egg. There were many, many more just like it, and they were all beginning to hatch. The archivist who blew up the bridge may have taken out Choo Choo Charles, but they had a bigger problem now. How would they get off this cursed island? The archivist remembered that there was a building near the docks that contained a radio. Maybe they could use that to contact someone on the mainland. The archivist reached the building adjacent to the dock and went inside. 
They were relieved to find that they were right. There was a radio inside, and it worked. Mayday, Mayday! I need help sent right away! SOS, SOS! Is anyone out there? There was a giant spider train thing. It's down in the bottom of a ravine now, but... Well, I'll explain later. Just send help. Hello? Anyone? But there was no answer. The lights inside the building then suddenly cut out. The radio was no longer working either. The power was out. The archivist went outside the building and looked around. They spotted a wire on the side of the building hanging loose. It was the power line, and it had been cut. They then saw something skitter away around the side of the building. The archivist followed and jumped back in surprise. Clinging to the side of the building was Choo Choo Charles. Well, not Choo Choo Charles exactly, but a perfect copy of the spider train, just smaller, roughly the size of a small dog. The archivist thought it might be cute if they didn't know how deadly its larger predecessor had been. The baby version was about to prove that it could be just as dangerous too though, and without warning, leapt off the side of the building towards the archivist. It scratched at them with its thin metal claws, tearing at the archivist like a wild animal. The archivist grabbed the baby Choo Choo Charles and managed to pry it off. They threw the creature into the wall as hard as they could. The spider train appeared stunned for a moment, before standing up and rushing at the archivist once again. The archivist, unarmed and with no way to defend himself, was forced to flee, running away from the building as fast as they could. As the archivist ran, they looked back to see that the baby Choo Choo Charles was still chasing them, and soon the spider was joined by two of its brethren. The three spiders chased after the archivist, the small razor-sharp teeth that filled their mouths gleaming in the moonlight. The archivist spotted a collection of cabins in the distance. These were where the island's inhabitants had once lived. They wouldn't provide much in the way of protection, but the archivist didn't have many options, so they ran towards them. The archivist ran up to the closest cabin and tried the door. Locked. They ran to the next one. It was also barred shut. They looked back to see that the three little spider trains had nearly reached the cabins too. The archivist ran to the third cabin and pushed on the door. Success! The door swung open and they ran inside, slamming and locking the door shut behind them just moments before the baby choo-choos arrived and began scratching at the door. They quickly scanned the room looking for some kind of weapon, anything at all they could use to defend themselves. The cabin was nearly empty, just an old wood burning stove and a simple bed, but there in the corner was a shovel. It was better than nothing, it would have to do. As they reached to pick up the shovel, they heard a noise that sounded like metal scraping against metal, followed by a loud bang. It was coming from the stove. The door to the stove burst open and a small spider train came flying out. The archivist screamed and swung the shovel like a bat, knocking the baby Charles through the air. It hit the wall and slid down to the ground where it stayed motionless. Was it actually dead? No, the spider train woke and began to stand up on its shaky legs. Once it had its balance back, it attacked again. The archivist tried to keep it at a distance with the shovel, but the sound of glass breaking caused them to turn where they saw the other two crawling inside. No, not just two, three, no, four, no, even more. How many of these things were there? The archivist was about to get an answer to their question. They fled outside, and they could see that there weren't just a few of these baby Choo Choo Charles. There were dozens, and they were all coming for the archivist. The archivist threw down the heavy shovel and ran. They had to find somewhere safe. Meanwhile, on a Coast Guard ship not far from the island, the captain was standing on the bridge, wistfully staring out at the large moon hanging over the sea, when their communication officer burst in. Sir, I've just received a really strange message. The officer went on to explain that they had heard a radio broadcast sent out over a public channel. The signal was weak and cut off midway through, but it sounded like there had been an accident on a nearby island. Something about a train wreck? The captain was aware of only one island nearby that might have a train. The island of Araniram. The captain wouldn't delay. They'd go there straight away and see if there was anything they could do to help. The captain was right. Back on Araniram, there had been a train wreck. The original, fully grown Choo Choo Charles still lay where he had fallen, down among the debris from the blown up bridge. He was dead, but he wasn't alone. One of his children, a spider train that was identical to him in every way except for its size, had arrived. Soon, many more appeared. They had been searching for Choo Choo Charles and began to encircle him. As the babies appeared to mourn their lost parent, one of them broke out of the circle and crawled up onto the original Choo Choo Charles. It stood on top of the engine and something started to happen. 
Streaks of red energy appeared on the body of Choo Choo Charles. The energy began to flow up and into the smaller one, filling it with the same red, demonic energy that had once coursed through the larger train. The smaller spider train began to glow brighter and brighter as more and more of the energy was pulled into it. The others watched as their siblings kept absorbing energy, emitting a piercing scream before starting to grow in size. The archivist ran through the forest, but stopped as they heard the loud shriek echo across the island. They didn't know what it meant, but they knew it couldn't be good. There was no time to think about it, though, because another of the spider trains had dropped out of the trees and landed on the archivist. They managed to grab it by one of its legs and toss it away, but soon, more and more of them were dropping out of the trees. They had to keep running. They weren't out of the woods yet, and maybe they never would be. The archivist burst from the trees, still being swarmed by spider trains. There were so many of them, and they were everywhere. The spiders were moving fast. The archivist had no time to stop and think, or even catch a breath. The only way to go was straight ahead, towards a cave in the mountainside. The archivist ran towards the cave as fast as they could. As they got closer, they saw that there was a deep gorge separating them from the mouth of the cave. The archivist looked back. The spiders were in pursuit, but it was something off in the distance that caught their attention. The Coast Guard ship. Someone had heard their message and was coming to save them. They couldn't go back, though. There were too many of the spider trains between them and the coast. They'd have to go in the cave and hope to lose them inside. Without thinking about it, they leapt through the air, hoping their momentum would carry them across. The archivist soared through the air. They were going to do it. They would make it across. But no. Gravity won out and the archivist began to fall before reaching the other side. They reached out in desperation and caught the ledge. They began to scramble and pulled themselves up and onto the other side of the gorge. The archivist, panting with exhaustion, stood up to see the dozens of spider trains that had been giving chase, simply watching and waiting on the other side. Were they not going to follow? They'd have to find out later and ran into the cave. The cave was dark, but luckily they had a lighter to provide a tiny flicker of light as they made their way through the tunnels. Soon, though, they found that they didn't need the lighter. There was a soft glow coming from a chamber ahead that provided just enough light to see. The archivist entered the chamber and realized where the light was coming from. Eggs. There were tons and tons of the glowing spider train eggs, dozens of them, hundreds, maybe even thousands. And they were all empty. The archivist heard a noise coming from above and looked up to see that the ceiling was moving. There weren't just hundreds of these baby Choo Choo Charles. There were hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands just waiting to grow up into full-size demon spider trains. If they ever got off that island, well, who knew how bad it could get? The archivist knew what they had to do. They had to make sure that these spider trains never got a chance to get off the island, even if it meant that the archivist wouldn't either. They'd sacrifice themselves, just like their friend had on the bridge. The archivist turned to run out of the cave as the babies began dropping down off the ceiling. Back at the bridge, large spider eggs appeared on the edge of the ruined crossing, and soon, the newly grown offspring of Choo Choo Charles was pulling itself up. It wasn't yet as big as its parent, but even a half-grown Choo Choo Charles was still a threat. As it looked around, it spotted the Coast Guard ship approaching the docks and began to head towards them. The archivist followed the winding path up and around the mountain with more of the spiders in pursuit. There was a radio tower on top, and all they could do was hope that there would be something there that could help them. They reached the tower and began to climb the long ladder to the top. They climbed as fast as they could. The spider train babies would soon be there, and they could climb faster than the archivist could. When the archivist reached the top, they spotted exactly what they needed, a spotlight. The archivist pointed the spotlight towards the dock where they could see the Coast Guard ship pulling in and began to flash it at them. On the ship, the captain commended the communications officer. They had been right. There were people on this island who needed them and were signaling for help. The captain walked out onto the deck of the ship and was about to step off onto the dock when the communications officer came running out. Captain, wait! What was the problem? The communications officer explained that they had noticed something strange about the flashing light. It wasn't just a signal for help, it was Morse code, and the officer had just translated it. The message being signaled to them said, Stay away, Spider Train is here. Spider Train? The captain was confused, but wouldn't be for long, because the newly grown Choo Choo Charles suddenly appeared on the deck of the boat with a crash and attacked the captain. 
The archivist kept flashing the message from the tower, but stopped when the Coast Guard ship suddenly exploded into flames. That was it. The only way off the island. It was gone. But at least now, the spider trains wouldn't be able to leave either. The archivist then felt the tower starting to lean. The swarm of babies at the bottom had destroyed one of the legs, and the tower began to tip further and further. The archivist clutched to the tower and braced for impact as it broke from its foundation and fell to the ground. The archivist held on for dear life as the radio tower slid down the mountain. It came to a sudden stop, and the archivist tumbled off. They stood up and saw that they were back near the dock, the still burning wreckage of the ship floating in the water, small explosions still occasionally going off from within. Out of the fire of the ship emerged the grown Choo Choo Charles. It had the same demonic look on its face that its parent had just before it died, and it was surrounded by hundreds of its smaller brethren. The giant spider train started to move towards the archivist and attacked as its siblings formed a ring around them to watch the battle. The archivist dodged out of the way, but knew that this was a losing game. It would only be a matter of time before this new Choo Choo Charles got them. But then, the archivist noticed something. Any time they got too near the babies, the larger one would back off. The archivist realized that it was because the bigger one was being careful around its smaller siblings. It didn't want to hurt them. These demonic spider trains actually cared about something each other. And the archivist noticed something else, too. Out in the water, just beyond the wreckage of the ship, was an empty lifeboat bouncing in the waves. The archivist had a plan. They grabbed one of the small ones and clutched it tight to their chest, doing what they could to stop it from scratching with its metal claws. They backed away from the giant spider train towards the dock. When they reached the end of the dock, they spun around like a hammer thrower in the Olympics and tossed the small one as hard as they could. The bigger Choo Choo Charles took the bait and leapt to the side to catch its kin, giving the archivist enough time to jump off the dock and into the water. The archivist pulled themselves up into the lifeboat, grabbed the oars, and started rowing away from the shore as fast as possible. As the archivist drifted away from the island, they looked back to see the giant spider train and the many babies watching from the shore. This was far from over. Aim for the face! It isn't working! The special forces team opened fire on the strange creature in front of them. It was like nothing they had ever seen before, and no briefing can prepare you for what it will be like when you parachute into the middle of a fight against a gigantic half-train, half-spider that seems to have no purpose except to kill. And it was succeeding in that. The train demon swung its powerful metallic legs, taking out one team member after another. As more and more of the squad landed, decked out in their tactical gear and equipped with the latest in high-tech weaponry, the fighting intensified. Grenades were tossed and exploded in a shower of shrapnel and smoke. A Gatling gun roared as it spun up to unleash hundreds of rounds. The tide of battle seemed to be turning in favor of the Spec Ops team. The creature was being pushed back. It roared as they unloaded everything they had on it. As soon as a gun would run out of ammo, the magazine would be dropped, a new one would be slapped in to take its place, and the shooting would continue. Hundreds of rounds of ammunition were dumped into the train, and it started to show signs of slowing down. More of the team landed with their parachutes, took out their weapons, and fired. The train howled in a mix of rage and pain before collapsing to the ground. It was dead. They had killed the monster. Was that it? In their briefing, they had been told the foe they would face was gigantic. This bizarre hybrid was big, but nowhere near what had been described. Barely half the size, in fact. Unless their intel was wrong. Then that could only mean one thing. There were more of these out there, and at least one that was much, much bigger. The Special Forces team didn't have much time to discuss it, but they soon got an answer to at least half of their question. There were definitely more of these spider trains on the island, and they were coming for them. An entire wave of small ones attacked. They were much smaller than the one they had just fought, barely the size of small dogs, but they were fast and vicious. The Special Forces team leader called out to reload and get ready for another fight, and the team assumed tactical positions. The horde of small spider trains rushed in towards the team and were met with a concentrated blast of gunfire. These small ones went down much easier. It seemed their exteriors weren't as hardened as the larger ones, but there were so many of them, and they just kept on coming and coming. Through sheer force of numbers, they were able to keep pushing up closer and closer to the squad, and soon, one soldier was overwhelmed by a dozen of the creatures. They kept fighting back, though, and eventually the wave subsided. The only thing left was a pile of small spider trains forming a ring around the soldiers. 
What was happening on this island? They had been sent here with a very specific mission. Identify the threat that had destroyed an entire Coast Guard vessel and neutralize it. From grainy footage broadcast from the ship before it had been destroyed, the Special Forces team had gotten a glimpse of their foe. A living train with eight powerful legs and the twisted, smiling face of a demon. Satellite photos taken at the time of the attack showed that the enormous creature had headed towards a cave in a mountain after taking out the ship. A separate reconnaissance team had parachuted in closer to the cave entrance, while the assault team was directed to secure the rest of the island. Now, with a break in the action, they attempted to radio the other team. The reconnaissance team leader's radio crackled to life. They relayed their position back to the assault team, and they had entered the cave in the mountainside and were progressing through the tunnels. They hadn't encountered anything yet, but wait, no. The assault team listened as the sounds of gunfire came over the radio. What was happening? The recon leader came back on the radio. They had encountered some of the creatures, but they were able to fight them off. They had been small, almost like they weren't fully formed yet. The reconnaissance team pressed on, stepping over the small spider trains they had killed and made their way deeper into the cave system. The narrow tunnel they were in opened up into a large chamber. It was so big that even their powerful flashlights didn't light up the far end. Their mission was to find the source of these monsters, and as far as they could tell, this was where they were coming from. They continued on, keeping the assault team informed of their progress over the radio, until suddenly, the radio went silent. Recon team, are you there? What do you see? Over. No response. What is your status? Repeat, what is your status? Suddenly a voice came through the radio, but the recon leader told them to shut up, not to make a sound. It was unclear if that message was meant for the radio or for the rest of the recon team. What definitely wasn't intended was the scream that followed. More screams, more gunfire, and then a horrible, unnatural, guttural roar came over the radio. Retreat! Retreat! The recon team started to run back the way they had come, stumbling through the dark cavern as something in the dark chased after them. Something very, very big. What is it? What do you see? Asked the assault team. It's huge! It's... But then the radio went dead. There were no more messages from the recon team. Whatever they had encountered in those caves had gotten them. And if it was anything like what the assault team had been fighting against, then they were almost assuredly dead. But the assault team wasn't about to leave their fellow squadmates behind. Rescue mission had just been added to their list of objectives. Just then, another radio message came through. But it wasn't the recon team. This one was from out on the ocean. They were told that their ride off the island would arrive in one hour. The helicopters would land near the docks, and if the threats were that bad, then they wouldn't be able to wait around for long. If they were going to complete their mission, they had to start moving now. As the Special Forces team jogged across the island, they kept their heads on a swivel, aware that a threat could be lurking anywhere, behind a tree, inside an abandoned cabin, or even… There! It's coming up from the ground! One of the Special Forces members pointed towards a spot on the ground where the earth began to shake and bulge up. A huge, centipede-like creature soon followed, bursting out of the dirt like a whale breaching the surface. Fire! No one on the squad needed to hear the order. They were already unloading on the giant arthropod. The centipede darted around to and fro at lightning speed, its hundred legs a blur of movement. It charged at the soldiers with its gnashing jaws and grabbed one of the unlucky humans before diving back down into the ground with them. The remaining soldiers felt the earth rumbling beneath their feet, and it emerged once again with its victim nowhere to be seen. They continued to fire their weapons, and one of the Special Forces Heavy weapon Specialists took out a shoulder-mounted RPG. He struggled to get a lock on the unbelievably quick creature, but then he heard the solid tone telling him he's had it, and pulled the trigger. Smoke burst out of the back of the launcher as the rocket escaped its tube and headed towards the centipede, the grenade striking it square between its enormous bug eyes. There was an explosion of green goop that covered the Special Forces soldiers that caused them all to turn away. Its venomous blood burns on their exposed skin, and they had to rub dirt on their wounds to try and neutralize the searing pain. But at least the monster was dead, and they had only lost one of their own in the fight. They had to press on. The team continued their trek across the island, and soon the mountain cave that the recon team had disappeared inside came into view. As they neared it, the radio began to make noise once again. Is anyone there? Please help me! It was a member of the recon team. Apparently they were alive, but very badly injured. What was it? What happened in there? Help me! You have to help me! 
The assault team leader asked again for more information about what they might find once they went inside that cave, but the only response was a wet, choking cough, and then silence. The radio was dead again, along with whoever was on the other end. Whatever had attacked them in that cave had been terrifying, there was no doubt about that, but the assault team again asserted to each other that they wouldn't leave their friends in there to die, not if there was any chance that some of them were still alive. They'd rescue any who were left, and if possible, plant the tactical nuclear weapon they had brought with them and blow up whatever did this to them. The assault team reached the mouth of the cave and took out their own tracker. It immediately began to beep and point them deeper into the cave. At least it appeared that the recon team's location beacon was still functional. As the team made their way through the caves, they were attacked by more of the small creatures, but these were different from the ones they had seen outside. While they still had eight deadly metallic legs, their bodies were soft, as if they hadn't fully formed. The team's heavy weapons made short work of the small, weak ones, but soon, larger ones appeared. These ones also looked off, as if something had caused them to develop incorrectly. But just because their appearances were wrong, it didn't mean they were any less deadly. These bigger ones took significantly more firepower to put down, and when one grabbed onto one of the assault team members' legs and dragged him into an opening high up on the wall, all the rest of the team could do was listen to his screams as he was pulled into the darkness and disappeared. The team kept fighting forward, but soon began to be overwhelmed by the sheer number of creatures attacking them. The team had to retreat, but the only way to go was deeper into the caves. They began to run through the tunnels, which became increasingly narrower and narrower. When they reached a passage that was so narrow that only one of them could pass through at a time, they stopped. There was a loud noise coming from behind them. The cave began to rumble, and pebbles and dust rained down from the ceiling for a moment, before suddenly, the ceiling collapsed. When the dust cleared, the only route back out of the caves was buried, as were another two members of the assault team. Their numbers were thinning, and everyone on the assault team had the same depressing thought. They were losing this battle. But with the tunnel collapsed and no way to go but forward, they pushed on through the narrow passageways. The tracker was still somehow active, and the team kept moving in the direction it was pointing them. The passage grew tighter and tighter, to the point where they thought they may soon not be able to go any further. But then, to the whole team's relief, it opened up. The squad stepped out into a giant chamber. Would you look at that? The assault team looked around in amazement. Every surface of the huge room was covered in large, faintly glowing eggs, and every single one was hatched. This must be it, the source of where all the monsters are coming from. But it raised the question, if they're all coming from eggs, who laid them? And where was the recon team survivor whose signal they were following? The tracker showed that they should be right on top of them. The assault team leader shined his flashlight straight up towards the ceiling and got his answer. There, stuck to the ceiling by thick ropes of sticky mucus-like substance, was the recon team leader, or more accurately, the shell of what had once been the team leader. It appeared that their body had been used for food by the newly hatched spider, and now only an empty husk remained. Look, over there! One of the assault team members was quietly motioning towards the back of the cave. The assault team leader pointed a flashlight in the direction they were motioning and spotted it. There, at the far end of the chamber, was Choo Choo Charles. The real, the first, the original Choo Choo Charles. He was bigger than any version of the train spider hybrids they had ever seen. So big, in fact, that it looked like he could barely still fit inside of his trained carapace body. His massive body bulging against the metallic exterior, causing it to look like it might burst at any moment, like a train whose steam boiler might explode. One of the soldiers raised their weapon and pointed it at the enormous monster but the leader placed a hand on the barrel of their gun and pushed it down. There was something wrong with this creature. It wasn't attacking. It looked like it barely noticed them at all. The huge Choo Choo Charles was breathing heavily. It looked like it was in pain, like it was about to die. A special forces team leader approached the mammoth train spider, and to his surprise, he thought he heard a voice. Did any of you hear that? But none of his team had. The voice spoke again, though, and it was now clear to the team leader that it was only in his head. The giant Choo Choo Charles was speaking, but telepathically. I know why you're here, it said between labored breaths. You're here to kill me. But before you do, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you my story, my real story. 
The assault leader knew it was a bad idea to allow a massive monster to telepathically commune with them, but at the same time, he felt compelled to listen. Choo Choo Charles went on to tell the assault leader that he was aware there was a rumor on the island, a rumor that he had once been the son of Warren Charles III, the owner of the mining company that had come to this island. That Warren Charles' son had been injured in a terrible accident that set him on the path to one day becoming Choo Choo Charles. But it didn't happen like that. Not exactly. It was true that Warren Charles III had come to the island. There, his miners began to dig, using the natural cave system of the island as the basis for their mine. The miners dug down deeper and deeper and deeper, but they dug too greedily and too deep. There, far below the surface, they found something. A huge, horrible creature unlike anything they had ever laid eyes on before. A creature that had been cruelly sealed away centuries before by the island's original inhabitants, but now the miners had set it free. Once the monster was awake from its long forced hibernation, it needed to feed, and luckily its favorite food had come right to it. The monster quickly gobbled up the miners who had breached its prison, but it needed more. The miners soon caught on to the danger lurking deep in the mine, and no longer would they dare to venture down and risk being eaten. The monster needed a new tactic to feed. Now it is true that Warren Charles III had a son, a very special boy who was oddly attuned to the island, seemingly aware of its history despite it not being written down in any history book. The boy began to feel a strange connection to something down below the surface, a feeling that he should venture down into his father's mines and explore. One night, the boy could no longer resist the urge and snuck into the mines. The boy journeyed deep down through the caves, eventually finding the monster that had called to him. The monster took the boy, with the plan to use him as ransom. The boy would be released, provided that others were sent in his place that the monster could feed on. This was Warren Charles' only son. There was no chance he would let him come to harm if it meant exchanging a few miners. After all, they died in the mines quite regularly in accidents, but to the monster's surprise, he refused. Warren Charles III stood at the narrow entrance to the monster's cave and called out, telling him that he wouldn't agree to the trade. The boy was expendable. His workers were not. There would be no new miners to make a meal of, but the monster had discovered another source of nourishment. Warren Charles's son was understandably upset with his father's decision to leave him to die at the hands of the monster. His sadness at being abandoned, though, soon turned into rage. Rage at his father. Rage at the entire mining operation. Rage at the entire human race. The monster recognized this burning, seething hatred inside the boy and found that it was the only source of sustenance it needed. The monster absorbed more and more of the boy's anger, growing even bigger and stronger. With his new strength, the monster was able to fully burst free from the cave prison. It saw a piece of Warren Charles's mining equipment, a huge train with mechanical spider legs instead of wheels, and crawled inside of it like a suit of plate armor, the train eventually fusing with the monster's own body to create a demonic, hybrid creature. No longer confined to the mines, the monster, which had been nicknamed Choo Choo Charles by the island's residents, began to terrorize those foolish enough to remain. As the monster killed more and more and grew stronger and stronger, it soon found that it had the strength to begin reproducing. It started laying eggs, and the creatures that would hatch didn't look like the original monster, but the new, half-spider, half-train that it had become. The monster continued to grow too, and soon found that it was too big to leave the cavern, but that was okay. Its children would still be able to leave and hunt, and when they killed, their power would grow, and so too would their parents. He would remain beneath the earth, and would keep getting bigger, stronger, more powerful, and he would keep laying more and more eggs, and no matter how many times the humans killed one of his children, there would always be more. And the child, the son of Warren Charles III, the one he left to die, well, he did. His anger turning back into sadness as he waited endlessly for his father to come rescue him. Why are you telling me all this? The assault leader was confused by what the creature could possibly hope to gain by revealing its full history. Was it some kind of trick or a trap? No, no. It's much more simple than that. I only wanted someone to know my story. But it won't matter, because now it's your turn to die. 
The giant version of Choo Choo Charles began to stand up on its metallic legs, the metal groaning from the strain of trying to contain whatever was inside of it. The train monster began to emit a terrible, guttural noise, and the assault team members all had to cover their ears to try and drown it out. But the groaning was soon replaced by the sound of metal hitting the cave walls. Rivets were popping out of the train and shooting out like bullets. The assault team dropped to the ground and covered their heads to take cover as the spider train's body exploded in a hail of metallic shrapnel. When the assault team looked up, the train creature was no longer there. Standing in its place was an enormous creature that seemed to be made entirely out of fire, a demon with eight glowing hot legs of lava. This was the creature's final form. It hadn't been dying, it was evolving. The demon attacked and the assault team fought back. They raced around the cavern and took firing positions, but their bullets appeared to have no effect on the creature. It swiped at them with its flaming appendages and took out one soldier after another, flinging their smoking, smoldering corpses across the room. The assault team leader took cover behind a clutch of hatched eggs and tried to radio for help, but there was no signal this deep underground. He then heard a strange sound. It was a voice, a little boy's voice. It was Charles, the actual original Charles, Warren Charles IV. Somehow, against all odds, he was still alive. He couldn't remember how long he had been down in this cave, the demon feeding off of his sadness and fear, but now, after seeing the bravery that the soldiers showed by coming down there to rescue one of their own, he wasn't afraid anymore. As the demon continued fighting against the soldiers, the boy told the leader that he knows how to destroy it. He needed a weapon that was very powerful, and then he could use his connection to the demon to feed it to him. The leader knew just the thing, the tactical nuke. He told the boy to wait there and darted across the room to where their demolition expert was still alive and taking cover. He brought him back to the boy and explained the plan. The boy told him that they should arm the weapon and then leave him alone to take it to the demon, their connection forged after so long meaning that it wouldn't attack him. The boy also knew something else, a way out of the cave. There was a secret tunnel hidden behind a clutch of eggs. The soldiers could take it and it would lead them right back to the surface. The assault leader told the boy no, that he won't allow him to sacrifice himself. But the boy insisted there was truly no other way, and the leader had no choice but to allow it. The demolition expert began the arming procedure, but the demon spotted him before he could finish. He charged forward and grabbed the demolition expert with his burning spider arm, lifting him high up in the air before slamming him down into the ground in a shower of ash and sparks. The leader grabbed both the boy and the bomb and ran across the room, ducking behind some rocks to finish the arming procedure. When he completed his task, a light on the tactical nuke glowed red. It was ready. Once the button was pressed, it would only be a few seconds before it detonated. The demon took out the last remaining member of the leader's squad and turned its attention towards him. Once the soldiers were gone, the demon would be free to leave the cavern, its power strong enough to burn a hole straight up through the earth to the island's surface. It would no longer be contained. Go! Now! The boy yelled at the leader to leave. The assault leader ran towards the spot where the secret tunnel was supposed to be, as the boy, using all of his strength, held the tactical nuke up above his head. You! Yeah, you! The boy shouted at the demon, causing it to turn its attention towards him. He began to criticize the creature, telling it that it was weak and pathetic, sending its own children to fight and die for it, while it hid down in a cave, feeding off of a little boy. It wasn't a powerful demon, it was a sad, miserable wretch that deserved nothing more than to spend its life in an underground prison. It never should have been woken up, and it certainly wasn't going to leave this place again. The demon was infuriated by the boy's words and began rushing towards it, its heavy legs causing the ground to shake as it kept coming for the boy. The demon was nearly on top of him, its flaming mouth opening up to eat the boy in one bite. The boy didn't move though, he bravely stood his ground, holding the bomb above his head. Preparing to press the button that would activate its final detonation sequence once the monster was close enough. But before he could press the button, the boy feels his body being grabbed and the bomb pulled away from his grip. It was a special forces leader. He grabbed the boy and took the bomb away from him, armed it, and tossed it up into the demon's mouth in one swift motion before sliding out of the way. In its surprise, the demon swallowed the nuclear weapon. It stood up, choking, and looking around for the boy and the soldier, but they were already nearly to the secret tunnel. The monster continued to choke as the timer on the bomb inside its body ticked down, and just as the boy and the soldier ducked into the tunnel, the bomb detonates. The boy and the soldier are knocked hard by the blast, the shockwave that ripples through the cave system pushing them out. They both burst out of a hidden entrance at the base of the mountain and find that not only are they still alive, but they are staring up at the open sky. 
with the first light of dawn casting a warm, orange glow across the island. The cave entrance had collapsed behind them, leaving them alone on the beach with the only sound coming from the waves. But off in the distance, the leader spots a ship making its way towards the island. The boy stands up too. He's okay. They're both going to be okay. <laughs>